Right, evening all. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're doing short game today. Now, uh, the difference of this tonight's one over all the ones we've done before is that the team, we're splitting this up, so we are covering pretty much all areas of the short game, and each of the team are doing a different area. So we're going to start off with Tom doing pitching, sorry, with Lee doing chipping, Tom doing pitching, Chris doing bunkers, and I'll finish off with doing some all right, so uh, so hopefully you can get, uh, you'll see a theme running through the evening, but uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of it. If you just pick one or two bits out of it, that's uh, enough to take away and, and help you. So, um, without further ado, let's hand it to Lee on chipping. Okay, right, let me just flip these out. <laughs> right. The main things that we're going to be talking about today is full swing versus chipping. What is different? We're going to look at uh, main things will be set up, we do differently in the setup when we're setting up for chipping. Um, also, we're going to look at what we do in the swing differently, um, and also we're going to look at sort of um, what we do differently in the tempo, and then lastly, sort of some finished references that we can give you just to make sure that you get better chips. Okay, so set up. What we need to make sure of when we chip in is that we post up on the left side. So posting up on the left side sounds pretty technical. But if you think about your full swing, in the full swing, when you set up, your pressure as you swing will move over to the right foot. As you start to come through, you start to move your pressure back over to the left foot. In chipping, there's not enough time for that to happen because it's only a short shot. So we want to make sure that we put all the pressure up onto the left side. So a good drill to practice that would be hitting some chips, where you come up onto the toe. You'll see that most of my pressure is down onto the left foot. And when I'm doing the action, I want to make sure that it stays there. Having that heel up like that will stop me from rocking back and trying to lift the ball up. That's the important thing about pressuring onto the left side. And it will look something like this. It will look like you're sort of sitting into the left side, really putting 90% of your pressure down onto that left side. Next one we've got, again, it sounds technical, but lead side lower. I like this one. Um, with the pelvis, I think this is where most people go wrong. When they're trying to post up onto the left side, or um, another common phrase is people say, well, you've got to get your weight on your left side in chipping. Most people will sort of slide into the left side like that. And as you can see with the pelvis, as soon as you slide into the left side, left side goes high. If I try and play a chip shot from there, it's very difficult for me. If I try and rotate as much as I can from my left side high, it's very difficult for me to rotate. So what I want to see you do when you're pressuring left is that you just give a little bit of a tilt down on the left side. An easy reference to do that would be put the club down your down your um, sternum there, down the spine, and if you tilt the base of your spine to your right heel, that gets my left side low, and from there I'm very free to rotate into the follow through. That's a nice little tip there to, to make sure we're rotating. Hands high, that's another one that we need to make sure that we're doing. If you're low down here, which we see a lot of people, one, it encourages the heel to hit into the floor first, flipping over, not going to get a good strike there. You're going to get a lot of uh, variability. Maybe get a lot of full shots, a lot of fat shots as well. So get the hands up high, put it almost up onto the toe, and what happens there is that gets the club to slide. That's what we're looking at. We're looking for the club to slide on chipping and not to dig and flip. Also helps to stabilise the left wrist. If you see when I get my hands nice and high, I've always locked the wrist into a nice high position. Whereas if it's low, there's tendency for me to just use them a little bit too much. That's much more stable, more one piece, that's too free. And if you think about it, if you're using your wrist too much, then it's very difficult to, to get the right contact on the ball. I think with a lot of, uh, a lot of people that we see chipping, uh, very, very often we see people trying to strike the, the ball first and then really go straight to the ball. And, what the saying is from this position, we're actually using the bounce of the club to slide through the ball so you get a wider margin for error on your strike. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's all about margin for a <laughs> 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 Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so we're into that set up position. We're posting on the left side. That's getting the pressure down to the left side. You see what I'm doing now? I'm not leaning over to the left side too much. I don't want you sort of putting weight over to the left side. It's important that we've got pressure rather than moving your weight about. That's an important thing to sort of separate the two. So, on the left side, lead side a little lower to help me rotate. Hands high. And then I've got a nice little um, last one, which would be the handle position, where it is relative to you. So, we sometimes get asked, is it best to play it forward? Is it best to play it neutral? Or is it best to play it back? And the truth is you can play chips from all them positions. But the key thing is, if you start neutral, and I'll tell you what this is in a minute, <laughs> start neutral, you've definitely got to return back to neutral. If you start neutral and then start to push through with the hands and get that forward, then that means that the club has come off the ground, you're then in trouble. You've then got to start adding some dip to try and get the contact and then trying to judge the dip is going to be way too hard. You're going to struggle. So we recommend, because there are ones that are more easy to play with, setting up neutral. Good thing about neutral is it means that you're going to encourage the club to come back to how it's meant to come, meant to come back. Uh, so that's going to help you to slide the club through. Um, where handle position forward, you can see that that front edge gets a little bit sharp, <coughs> and that can cause some problems, get some digging. Okay, so any questions on setup there? Ball position. Ball, ball position, yeah, pretty, pretty similar to what you would do with your 7 iron. I mean, middle to slightly forward. Again, we want to encourage that we're getting the right angle attack into the ball. Don't like back too much. I mean, there are, we used to have people saying, yep, yeah, back is good. The problem with getting the ball too far back is it encourages the, the swing to work a little bit too inside, which I'm going to move into next. It encourages the low point of the swing to be too far behind. And if you're getting that, again, you're going to hit behind the ball or the club's coming up too much. Anyone struggle from a double hit? Where you hit the ball and then hit the <laughs> captain in the back. <laughs> so the bit that I'm going to But I also recognise the word fat. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of distance would you start to do? Uh, this, uh, uh, how far? From the how far? Um, just off the green, to be honest. I mean, up to about five yards off, I would sort of yeah. do uh, this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the good thing, what you'll see is once we get into pitching, you'll see there's a, 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 gen, a, a clear link between what you're going to sort of set up here and then what you're going to set up in your pitching. It's going to be sort of like a, a, a natural extension on. Um, I think Tom, you'll. Yeah. The difference between two from that point <clears throat> Okay, so that ball position brings me brilliantly onto swing direction. Um, problems occur in the backswing when you get that club working too inside on the backswing. If you get it working too inside on the backswing, it's very difficult to get it back out and front, and it's very difficult to, to do the next part, which is exiting left, which is very important, which I'm going to explain. <coughs> so, I'd like to grab a ball. So, what we talk about double hitting, if you get the club working too far on the inside, it tends to lead to the club working outside on the way through, or even straight. And if you get the club working straight with the ball, because in chipping the ball comes off very slow, doesn't come off very fast, the club has time to catch up with the ball. And then one, two, you've double hit it unfortunately. So there's, there's, a, there's a clear explanation of how you shouldn't get the club working straight or out to the right. So straight back allows the club to then exit on the left, and you can see there's a clear dispersion about where the club and the ball are going. Hopefully the ball goes straight and then the club exits left. They're not going to collide with each other, um, so the double hit shouldn't be an issue. There's a good drill to practice this. If I grab two sticks. So one on the floor. These can be clubs, but I'd be careful. I don't accept any blame for damaging your, your clubs and shafts. But you want to put a club, two rods, just in a nice straight line, and give yourself a touch of margin for over either side. We sell lines that you can So what we're looking for here is as we're coming through, we're making sure that we swing through and out the other side of the rods. Now what we would see with a lot of people here is as they're coming through, they're either 
take the rods out on the inside because they're working too much in to out relative to where we're supposed to be going, relative to the target, or they'll be coming over. Exiting left doesn't mean pulling the arms in or coming left, it's just because I'm rotating you can see that the club has come onto the left side. You don't need to crawl in, Yoshi. <laughs> So I'd recommend you have a go at that drill because it will really show where your swing is, is sort of directing. Um, as I say, too much into out, you'll probably take the rods and they'll start to skip over there. Too much across the ball, and the rods will start to go that way. And you'll start to get a few toe strikes. Inside, you can get a few heel strikes. So a lot of variability in the face if you're working the path in a, in a bad way. Okay. Tempo and sequence. So, just going to explain a little bit about what's different in your full swing to chipping. Just set something up quickly. Okay, in full swing, it's very important that we initiate once we got to the top of the back swing. So, that's my centre line. So, imagine that there's a ball. Here, and I'm just going to swing in an upright position. So as I take my back swing, the best way to start the swing down is from the ground up, which you probably heard that before. If you've had lessons before or listened to the TV, they all sort of to say how the best players really use the ground. So what I'm going to try to do here, I'm going to try and get my belt buckle out in front of the rod first, then my chest will come through in front, then my, arm, my arms, then the hands, and then the club will join up because I'm rotating through it. So that's what happens in a full swing. Hips, chest, arms, hands, club. In a chip shot, because it's only a small distance. So it just explain why that is in the full swing as opposed to yeah. short. There yeah. is a reason why it's that sequence, which is Yeah. Yeah, so in a chip swing you don't need that um, the power. You don't need power, you don't need lag. Um, so in the full swing to, to have that sequence, um, it's very good for creating speed power, lag, compression on the ball. Chipping is a, is a, a, a much smaller, smaller shot. You don't need any of them elements. So what we do to, to differ our sequence from what we're just doing in the full swing, we're going to keep the hips a lot quieter. So if I line up really, uh, relative to the, the rod, which again is where the ball should be, just here. I'm going to keep the hips quiet, and I'm going to get a feeling that everything is moving together. So chest, arms and club, club, they're all coming through together, which means that I've got much more control over speed of the club, and then hopefully much more control over the distance the ball goes. That's why we limit the number of power sources. So when I was doing the, four, the sequence there, we've got four elements that create power. You've got your hips, you've got your chest, you've got your arms, you've got your wrists. If you're using all them four elements in chipping, it's very hard to, 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 um, to control distance. So you've got to limit them and just make sure that your chest is the only power source, which means it'll be more, more easy to control your distance. Okay, hinge or no hinge? That's a question that we get asked a lot. There's good players that use hinge in the backswing. If we just relate it back to here, Wrist can be another power source, um, and it requires a lot of timing because you've got a hinge, and then obviously on the way through you've got to unhinge, so you've got to time that. We like to, to lock out the wrist by putting the hands high and just use the chest, and we find a much more consistent way to present the club rather than having to try and time the hinging and the unhinging. By the way, you guys, you like uh, locking out the wrist? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a much more consistent way to, to produce the club. Okay, once we've got all them going on, we're on to finish reference. I think it's clear enough, good to have a clear picture of what you're trying to achieve when you're trying to play a chip shot. Most people just focus on the ball, but it's important to realise that the ball is only halfway through the swing. So I've got some finish references here that I want you to try and put into practice. Um, so when I'm going through the ball, you'll see because I'm rotating through, the hands come round to the left. So I'm going to try and finish with my hand in front of my left hip. 
And because I don't want to use the wrist too much and scoop it over that side, I'm going to keep the club head out to the right slightly of the hands. So that's going to be on the right side of my body. So again, as I'm coming through, I'm just looking to rotate. Hands have gone round in a circle, and that's us exiting left round the ball. But I'm going to keep that club out onto the right. If I'm using my wrist too much, you can see that the club really sort of scoops around the corner, which uh, again can cause all sorts of inconsistencies in how you hit the ball. I think it's good to have that. I've put another thing here, no throw action. I think that's a, a good term to sort of take. Again, coming back to that we're not trying to hit a chip really, really hard, and it's much more controlled. What that means is as I'm coming through, I'm trying to keep my right arm, for right-handers, in a bent position rather than trying to straighten it. Because if you're straightening your right arm, obviously, one, you're adding power, and two, you could be causing some inconsistencies in, in the depth that you're going to hit the ball. If you're down here and you're straightening, you could be getting the club going into the ground too much. So it's important once you're setting up that that right arm is staying and you're just pivoting. You're just turning through. It's not throwing the club in a chip because we don't need to. We don't need the power. It's all about just making sure that comes through and it's much more turn of the, the hips and the, and the top half and the arms just follow through. One more thought before I pass over to Tom. And it's a swing thought. So if you think about a swing, you're pushing someone, uh, swinging a play pipe. You're pushing someone on a, on a swing. Um, what happens is it starts to swing. Now, <laughs> this is great, isn't it? It sounds a lot better. Right, so what happens is it starts to swing, okay? And to keep the momentum going, what you start to do is you give it a little push. Yeah, just to keep the momentum going. Now, the club will work in the same way. If you start it initiating with the chest, it will swing. When it gets to impact, we want to give it a little push with the hips and the body to keep it going through. Because if you stop, the club will stop as well. So back, push it through, tap the hips, turn the chest, hold your finish. Don't try to interfere too much with the club, that's what I would say. Most people try to use the hands too much in a chip. Just let it swing from the body, stay relaxed, and turn through. I'll pass over to Tom. Okay, lots of things to think about there. Um, so I'm going to make it a little bit simple to see some more hard work for me. Okay, so what is a pitch shot? Can anybody explain to me what a pitch shot is? Well, it seems like a pretty simple question. Get it off Disaster. Get it off the ground. Get it off the ground. Right there. Okay. Anybody else? Longer than a chip, but not a full shot. Okay. A pitch shot is a, an extension of a chip shot, effectively. So. Extension of chip shot. What club are you going to use for a pitch shot? Pitching wedge. Yeah. Depends on where I want to land. Pitching wedge is the general answer we get. Just because it's called a pitching wedge doesn't mean it's the only club that can be used for a pitch shot. Uh, we can use any club for a pitch shot. There are no rules. Okay. Assess the situation in front of you. If you are if you have really terrible ground in front of you and you need to pitch all the way to the green and you want to stop quick, we'll use a lofty club. If you are on a very nice, fast running links course with lovely ground in front of you, use that ground. Okay? We don't then need to go into the air. We use a 6 iron, we use a 7 iron, we use an 8 iron. Okay? Assess the situation in front of you, don't just go to the pitching edge because it says pitch. Alright? So, any club. What should you focus on on the pitch shot? Landing. Perfect. Hey, stop. <laughs> <laughs> landing spot. Okay? A landing spot is the most important thing for us to focus on because once we've done that, that is our job done. Okay? The ball is going to roll from there or bounce or spin or do whatever you hope it's going to do. <laughs> but um, once you've done that, you've done your job. Okay, you put your landing spot, that is what you can do. Okay? Good, we'll start that one. Okay. Continuity. Huh? Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.
continuity of technique. Okay? We're going to start to be on the short game area now and to put a lot of uh, these things that he's um, giving you into practice, hopefully. That technique is going to be continued for a bit shot. However, we need more than that. We need a power source. Okay? So we are going to be using our body as our power source. We need to rotate more. Okay, so Lee was working on the fact there that you will be using your body and your body will uh, allow your club to move. Okay, this is your power source. Once we go to a pitch shot, we extend that rotation. Hips, chest, shoulders, extend and rotation back, but also extend and rotation through. So we're on a big swing now. Okay, <laughs> we're on a much, much bigger swing. Okay. Assessing the situation. What, what do you mean extending rotation as opposed to length, just from the point of view? Lee, when Lee's doing what his one was saying about how really the top half is doing all the work in the on the back swing on the ship shot, then there's the rotation of hips and everything all the way through. Tom said about the extension on the pitch shot is the chest in itself on the back swing isn't enough now. So you need more. So that's when the hips start helping that action. So it becomes a bigger rotation, bigger turn. So that Lee's was a little bit more wooden, lower half is fairly stable. Can't take the club further back than that, so we need now more. That's when just hips get involved. Just yeah, to... yeah. So um, all of us will struggle to turn 90 degrees of our shoulders, keeping our hips exactly at zero degrees. Okay, <laughs> we're all not that flexible. So if you are, <laughs> you're starting now to turn hips a little bit more. Okay, and with the hips, your knees will then start to separate back and forward as well. It's just a, a complete rotation. Okay, so everything is now going to rotate. You can see knees start to turn, hips start to turn, chest, shoulders, you know, almost coiled spring kind of way. Okay? So that's that's extension of rotation. Assessing the situation you face. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. One of the questions I get is how do I practice that? How how am I meant to know that? You've got two great golf courses out there that you can go out and practice. Okay, it doesn't necessarily need to be on the practice range. There are so many situations you're going to come up against. You will very, very rarely come up against exactly the same situation. So you've probably got to be equipped for every one that you come across. Practice them, okay? Go around the short game area. Take one ball, chip it, throw it into another place. Chip it, or pitch it, sorry. <laughs> pitch it. Remember, pitching is going to be further on the chip, so maybe we talk about you know, 10 to 15 yards, maybe 20 yards outside of the green, okay? That would be closer to a pitch shot. But remember, it's not just pitching wedge. Okay? Maybe take, so I say this in my lessons, take three clubs out of your bag and try the pitch with every single club. Six iron, eight iron pitching wedge. Okay? See which one of those starts to react better, which one you're most comfortable with. Is it going to your landing zone that you're trying to land it to? Okay? So take three clubs to a spot. One more of a six arm, one more of an eight arm, one more of a pitching wedge. Which one was the best decision? Okay. On that, in, in this situation, it was your eight arm. It rolled out nicely, it pitched in the landing spot, it rolled out nicely up three. Brilliant. That's the one I'm using in a similar situation when we're on the golf course. Okay? Just gives you a bit of an idea, a bit of um, practice. Okay? Good, solid, effective practice. Okay. Application. So, application of the shot. If we were to use our pitching wedge for every pitch shot that we had, we wouldn't be using the correct application. Club section is super, super important, uh, but repetition is good. So, for instance, myself and Mr. Og here, we may be in the same situation, okay? We may be behind a bunker, the pin is 20 yards up the green, okay? For me, it might be better to use a pitching wedge, but for you, it might be better to use a 9-9 because we're both going to have different launch angles with our, with our club, okay? So, therefore, you need to almost figure out your own, your own database of, of shots, own database of pitch shots. That comes through practice, okay? That only comes through practice. Last one on this point, strike is key for consistency. You can practice all you want, but if your strike isn't good, you're not going to create a efficient database as well good selection of shots, okay? So we need to first improve your strike, always improve your strike, 
now you can start to work on your um, collective of, of pitch shots that you're going to use around the green. Okay? Strike is super important. That's another subject that we can uh, get into a later day. Perfect. Uh, ask your coach. If you have a coach, <laughs> ask him why your strike is, is your strike consistent enough to pitch. Right, the question that we all get, and I get so many times in the pro show as well. <laughs> this is great, Tom, but how do I spin it like they do on TV? <laughs> all the time. Okay, all very, very similar. First one. Clean and unworn grooves. Do you think the pros on TV have clean grooves? Absolutely they do. They've got good caddies. Do they have worn grooves? Absolutely they don't because they get a fresh wedge every single time they go out. <laughs> but this is important. Okay? So clean your golf clubs, clean your grooves before you go out. How do you expect to be able to control a shot if you haven't got clean grooves? Okay? I think Harry would say you should buy a new lunch every month. Or would you like to say you should buy a new lunch every six months? Just to, just to go on a point on that one, not the, the club food, but just so you all know, most people believe that the grooves on a wedge or grooves on a golf club are to impart spin on the ball. It's not true at all. You could have a golf club with no grooves on it and you can still have maximum spin. The grooves on a golf club are designed to channel away water and debris, bits of grass, etc. away from the face, the ball has maximum interaction with that face. That's what creates the spin. It's the, it's the friction between the face and the ball. The grooves themselves aren't the thing that puts the spin on the ball, just so you're all aware of that. So when the grooves are worn down on a club, on a dry, perfectly dry day with a perfectly dry golf ball, and no grass in between the ball and the club face, you'll still get a decent strike on it. But on any dampness on, the, on a golf course at all, when you've got no, the grooves are worn on your face or they're full of dirt, you now won't get that interaction with the ball. So it's actually really important that you have a clean groove, not to spin the ball, but to make sure you get quality strike, which spins the ball, if that makes sense. So grooves aren't what people think, hence why the box groove square groove as it used to be called, was banned. Because a square groove having such a sharp edge was biting into the ball and therefore generating spin. Yeah, so you would notice I mean, that along with uh, ball technology as well, but how with the larters and, and old, older balls, they used to cut up quite a lot. Big, right? Yeah, with box grooves and balatas, yeah, they box, six around. Box grooves and, and these very, very soft rubber balls really, really used to cut up. You'll notice now that that doesn't happen as much. Um, okay, so you're not nice to sit on. Golf ball, okay? How are you going to talk a little about golf balls? No, not really, Tom. <laughs> no, <are> you? <laughs> okay, so there are, there are quite a few different golf balls, okay? And on your box of golf balls, it will say the um, parts, parts of what that golf ball is going to do for you, okay? Characteristics. Characteristics, yeah. and that's what yeah. If it is a high spin golf ball, it's going to spin more. <laughs> if it's a low spin golf ball, it's going to spin less. That's simple. Okay? Um, so use a golf ball that one measures up well to you. Um, that's probably the idea of yeah. more flight than, than full spin, but ask your pro. Okay? <laughs> um, Basically, if you're using a, a, a ball that isn't an uh, the very, if it's not a premium ball, which basically means that the cover is far more receptive. If you're not using a premium ball, don't expect the ball to spin. Just don't, whatever you do, that ball will not spin. So you have to have a premium cover on a golf ball. Now there's different sorts of those, but a premium cover on a golf ball for the ball to spin. And when we talk about spin, I don't think, I'm sure I'm not cutting over time in the sense, we don't just mean a ball that goes whoop. We just mean that having some grab onto the green when it lands, so it doesn't hit the green and and shoot through. So just getting a, a ball that fits you first and foremost is more important than a spinning ball, yeah. but if you can find a ball that fits your characteristics what trajectory you need ball, and you can get one with a better cover on it, as in a premium cover, you will get more control out of the cover. Also, uh, this one here, strike, okay? The better you strike the golf ball, the more, uh, the more consistent your spin is going to be, okay? So, 
this is this is very important. Again, this is uh, working. This will be working on in your lessons. So strike is, is very important for a uh, skill on the golf ball. Ball speed as well. Okay. Top players on TV create uh, an enormous amount of ball speed. Okay. Therefore, the ball launches higher and creates a steeper angle of descent. So I'm going to do a little demonstration for you with this ball. Okay. Steep angle of descent first with a little bit of spin. You can see it stops and stops pretty quick. Okay. A shallow. A shallower angle of ascent, let's say, so this one is going to fire into green lower, still set the amount of spin, glides forward and then grabs. Okay? So, depending on your ball flight, you want whether it's low or whether the angle of ascent is shallow or whether it's steep, okay? that, that will affect how the ball controls on the green. Okay? If it's low, you still get spin, but it will probably bounce forward first and then control. If it's steep, it will stop straight away and maybe come back a little bit as well. Okay? I googled this question because I wanted to see what the responses were. They were terrible. Okay? Um, every, pretty much every single one says you need to hit down on the ball to create spin. That is awful. Okay? I've never seen such a bad response to a question. It makes me question Google a bit. Okay? <laughs> but, Hitting down on the ball or hitting a descending blow on a ball is not how you create spin. Not at all. <laughs> okay. So that is not how you create spin. Okay, or that is not how we would advise you to create spin. Right. I think just to clarify that, you are by default going to be hitting down on the ball. That's the nature yeah. of the action. So you do need to hit down on the ball, but you don't need to hit more down on the ball yeah. to, to get spin at one point. Trying to hit down on the ball will cause disconnection in the golf swing and is not something we would recommend. Okay? Um, if you are if you have a correct technique that allows I can't wait to go skate times. <laughs> if you have a, a good technique that allows you to hit ball first and then divot, okay, which is a descending blow. That will create a good spin on the golf ball, or golf ball okay? or assistance spin on the golf ball. <laughs> okay. Miss, miss, just we touched on. Um, oh, we can't do. Best interaction of club on ball. So, yeah. In order to maximum spin, maximum control, which lot? Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> Tom is genuinely petrified. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we have a range of golf balls in, um, so golf clubs in our in our set. Okay, the most lofted club does not impart the most spin. Okay, with a, a lob wedge, you will get almost a glancing blow off the club face. Okay? Yeah, so it slips off the face and pops up and lands soft. You are not creating as much spin as you would that something that hits the face a lot more, almost like a, what you say, the most... 50 thing. degrees, no, gap 50 wedge, degrees, yeah. which is basically a gap wedge, or pitching wedge, is the most spinning golf club in your golf bag. Because of a lot of it, because of the angle of the yeah. set. As well, Effectively, right? you've got to imagine, obviously, if there's a lot of loft, the ball is actually going to slip up that face quite a bit. So what we want, we don't want too little loft that just pushes it forward, we want an element of the ball gliding up the face while still going forward. That puts maximum spin on the ball. So if ever you're stood over a shot where it's a choice you want it to spin, if you can hit a little half swing pitching wedge, you'll get more spin with a pitching wedge than you would by doing a full sand iron. A full sand iron might come down steeper, so stop fairly quickly, but it will have no spin on it relative to the pitching wedge. Just say that. Uh, the, other one, the other one you mentioned earlier on to me, which is really good, was the difference between tour pros and, uh, yeah. and why they, they can get it to spin, yeah, it's the green. Yeah, green conditions. Okay, so uh, the guys on tour have amazing greens, they have genu <laughs> genuinely have receptive greens and really, really quick greens. Okay, so when a bit of spin is imparted, it will travel a long way. On TV, that's amazing. Okay, now the Gogs, for instance, has very firm greens, okay, and average based greens. So therefore you're not going to see a lot of spin in parties as you may do if you went and played 
at all green. Okay? So if you get the same, same shot into both, you will see different reactions. So that's something for you to judge, and when you go away to other golf courses as well, you, know, you can start to uh, see how that creates different movement. What about the quality of the turf that you hit on? Um, you are hitting generally the ball first. So shouldn't, unless there's more grass that is getting trapped in the grooves, like I mentioned earlier, yeah. and you get a flyer, as we say, I would, I would say, you know, that shouldn't. No, no, you are on the right line. Firmer turf does automatically mean that the ball will ride up the face quicker. Yeah. Because Perfect. the car's not disappearing yeah. into the turf. So therefore, firmer turf, like Lynx turf, yeah. if you can hit a really good strike on Lynx turf, it's going to spin. It does. It's going to spin, yeah. So firmer turf does put a little bit more spin on it, but it's quite its negative already. I nearly said that. Do you have the same setup as your ship, I should Yes, yes, sorry. So it is an extension of the ship shop. Okay, I'm not, that's, you start from chip and then work up to pitch, same setting, uh, we're just extending rotation back and then forward. Well, you don't have the handle over the chip, but you still have the high hands. Wherever you're going to return to. Okay, so high hands, yeah, and if you start it forward, if as long as you're returning to forward, perfect. If you're neutral or, or back, as you said, right. as long as you're returning to that point, we're, we're happy. Okay. But yes, high hands still. In a nutshell, what Lee said, is chipping and pitching are the same. There is just a bigger swing with a pitch shot than there is a chip shot. But it's the same setup, the same principles, which is you post, you rotate. It's just how big is that rotation around that post in its simplest terms. And so that's why it started a league, moved on to you probably see there's a, a, going to be a running theme through this. Um, but I think, I think something that's really important for you all to recognise is the more variables you add in, in other words, Lee touched it and Tom touched it, the more power sources you add to this situation, the more difficult the situation becomes. You're not practicing for four hours a day like tall pros, they can do what they like. You guys are playing once a week, twice a week, not that much practice. So if you think of every single thing you do as an element, is it, is it a power source? Rotations are a power source, hands are a power source, legs are a power source. All these extra little things, if you keep adding power sources, you're losing control. So if you can keep to the idea, as Lee said, of it's basically Lee's situation is there's virtually no power source but the chest. Tom's situation is there's not much power source on the way back, a little bit right there, a little bit more of a committed through soon because it's a bigger swing. So the power source is the rotation, never the the hands or the legs as such. Any more questions? <laughs> what about with a bare line over a hundred feet? Yeah, that's similar to what uh, we said with the firm, firm turf conditions. Okay, you're, you're still creating the same movement. You still want to create the same movement. As long as you're, as long as you're striking the ball first, it should be the same. It should be the same. It doesn't matter whether you've got a sponge underneath the ball, or you've got a <coughs> sloppy line underneath the ball, or the ball's rock solid. You know, it's a rock solid underneath the ball. As Tom said, if your descending blow, which comes from as Lee said at address, sitting that way, which naturally makes a descending blow. If you are getting ball first with a descending blow, it doesn't matter what's under the ball. You're going to get a strike. As soon as you start losing a little bit of the bottom of the strike, you might catch the ground a bit before or a bit after, now you might have some issues. So that's why strike, and both coming in, is number one priority to, in order to get consistency. Get strike first, you can do the rest. If you <coughs> tight lies or, or bare lies, just to again, go back to your coach and, and explain why, and you may be the almost the bottom, of your, <laughs> bottom of your the bottom of your almost swing arc is fractionally behind the ball, so you will, sh you will find it tougher on tight lies than you will on soft lies. Good? Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both the boys have said, have said the element of getting that way slightly in address. Both the lads have said that. So if you think in terms of, as Lee said, if you use that stick and you are turning on that spot, you're going to come back to the same spot. You're just going to come back to the same spot. So the second you have a problem with strike, you've got to ask the question, are you moving in some way, shape or form around the fixed bottom of the arc? Because in, in reality, physics as it were, 
it's just a radius, it's just an arc that comes back. Now if I move, my radius is the same, but the arc is moving. So if you think to yourself, the more fixed you are, that's why we keep talking about posts, the more fixed you are, the bottom of the arc is in the same spot every time. So that's really why the <coughs> posting up, posting up, that's what it's all about. So if you have strike issues, just check whether or not you're moving off your post and not rotating around. Good? Is there not, is there not um, one shot that's a higher percentage success than the other? So instead of taking your stand iron and floating up to land two feet from the pin, or doing a ship and run? Generally, the shortest swing, in effect, is going to be the easiest shot. Okay, it's going to be the most consistent shot because you're moving less. Less variables, yeah. yeah. So, if you can take the, the lower option, if it's a possibility, uh, we always say if your landing spot is like two yards on the green, if you have to hit the green, like landing spot is two yards on the green, take that <coughs> landing spot. Don't take one that's a lot closer to the pin because you'll be taking a shorter shot with a less left pick up. How, however, as, uh, as, as from the question point of view, if you're if you're somebody who you could be on that chipping area and you can hit any landing spot you choose, yeah. do what you like. If, if you if you stand there and go, do you know, what? I would be more consistent in hitting a sand iron to that landing spot than an eight iron to that one. Use the sand iron. Generally, though, as we said, we find that the more you can bring it shorter and shorter and shorter, is in the flight element, which is the shortest thing. More consistent generally than those. Yeah. If they're all more consistent with your sand line, I guess it's because you favour your sand line and you kind of with your sand line, therefore you're going to favour it and make it feel comfortable on the golf course. So maybe that then shows a weakness in your lower loft and you can work on that and then have a the whole arsenal of shots in the back. I think something that's, uh, that's quite important to realise though, which is the, ver the difference between short game and long game, major difference in short game and long game. In long game, the shorter the club, the easier it is to control. In short game, the longer the club is easier to control. For a, for a very simple reason, which is to keep talking about strike. If you look at the loft on that club, and I put a ball against it, there is only two grooves on that club hitting that ball. Now I'm not hitting with enough power in a short game shot to get the ball to compress against the face to go up to the fifth groove, fourth and fifth groove. As soon as you get an eight iron or a seven iron in, all of a sudden they're hitting four or five grooves. Well, four or five grooves is a far more consistent strike because it's the sweet spot than the bottom two grooves, which on a full shot would be a thing. So it's the opposite. If you can loft down, you'll get a better strike. Now, the better the strike, generally, the better the distance control is going to be on your flight. So it is a gap personal preference, but for most people, we find that the less lofted, the better the strike, the better the distance control. Right, Tom, stop panicking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh sorry, Thomas. I was just going to say with your thing you the stick. I've had a bit of a bit of chipping this. Uh, my handicap is very, very difficult, so I've just gone kind of left handed. And the consistency of strike, just left handed alone to control the skin of the other is amazing. So 9 out of 10 times I'm within 3 or 4 foot. So the right hand becomes involved. I'm going to talk about that in putting actually shortly, so yeah, right. we'll come to that. that okay. That's a really valid point, really valid point. Okay, so yeah, I'm pretty sure it's something to do with the stern and the head being around my bottom right hand is involved, but um, the consistency of strike just left handed is, is amazing. <laughs> yeah. R remind me that when we're doing the putting, but that actually that is an extremely valid point, yeah. Sorry, Ross, yeah, come on. Yeah. Just how, how does the pitching uh, with this the position you merge into your 40, 50 yards from the green and doing a sort of um, a half, you know, a sort of half swing. Where, where, how do you change over from posting to being a more normal swing, like a half swing? Is uh, it all, yeah? Great question. I don't know about you boys, but I work on the basis that anything up to, up to about shoulder high is a pitch shot. As soon as he goes over about shoulder high, it starts to become more, you need to start thinking it's in terms of swing. And the simple reason for that will be, sort of touch your but you just in the way. When you're playing a chip or a pitch up, you're trying not to use wrists. So you're very dead in the hands, because that means you can return the club more consistent. Because we don't need a power source. As soon as you get to shoulder high, now I'm going to struggle to continue turning past shoulder high, so there's going to be an element of the arms folding. And well, that's now become a goal swing. Maybe not a full goal swing, but it's become a goal swing. So, each and every one of you should work 
works in back swings just to think to yourself, where's the high point of my pitching action? To me, it's basically my right shoulder. I know my right shoulder is the maximum I can pitch for. As soon as it's longer than a right shoulder swing, it becomes a swing. Now, I have to be honest, as a person into me, I would go down from a 52 degree wedge to a pitching wedge and pitch every day of the week, if I can, over thinking, well, I'll just hit a swing with a 52. Because that softness of hands because you're not putting passes is so much more consistent than putting that power source in. So there's, people are always asking the questions just about chipping and pitching. Uh, you know, how far from the grid, how long, how, etc. chipping and pitching. The reality is, it's never about the length of the shot. You've got to get this into your heads. Short game is never about the length of the shot. It's about the length of the flight. Flight you control. Because Lee taught them, you control flight. Circumstance, landing conditions, and the club controls roll. So you only ever should think of a short game shot in terms of flight. You then have to pick a club that does that secondary part to that. So when you start thinking in terms of hitting an 80 yard shot, if an 80 yard shot becomes just a fly at 80 yards of me, you've got to hit a fairly big swing, that's going to go fairly high. The harder you hit a ball, the higher it goes, generally in golf. Therefore, it's not going to roll very far when it lands. So you're basically making a swing to hit at that yardage. As soon as you've got a shot where you could, say for example, a 30 yard shot because you're, you've got a tier in a green, huge long green, but the green only starts four yards in front of you, you've only got to hit it four yards, but with a club and a bit of energy that's going to get it to roll the rest. But if you've got to fly at the full 30, 35 yards, because there's a bunker at the front of the, before the green, same then shot, but now you've got to fly at the whole distance. So that becomes a swing. So it's never about length, it's about flight. That's the thing you've got to remember on short game shots. And that's where the crossover between chip and pitch sometimes for people gets a bit, bit hickledy pickledy because they look at length of the shot, not flight. I, I, was, oh God, I was going to say, I found that they're using the rescue club. Yeah, which we did the other day, yeah. Yes, um, really helped. Really yeah. Helped. Mm. Rescue club for all of you, just from a chipping perspective. The easiest club you can possibly chip with is a rescue club. <laughs> because a rescue club is what's known as a rocker sole. The whole of the sole is round. There's nothing on a rescue club that's going to stub or dig into the ground. So if ever you've got an opportunity where you can stand there just with a rescue club and just do that, the ball's going to only fly a little distance, but it's going to go whoosh when it lands. So if you've got a big tear and a green or a long green or something like that, use a rescue club if you've got an opportunity. It's such a good club to chip with. Such a good club to chip with. So I'm to do two and today and sort of use rescue club a couple of times. Where at times there was a, a tier in front of me, and then rolling out to a, a pin that was quite close, which I would struggle to hit a lofty shot that quick and get it to stop. So rescue club became the option, and I think our, our play partners looked at me a bit funny, going, why the hell is he using you know, rescue club? Um, but it's, it's a really, really nice ticket for my shots. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we had, I, I was just going to say, we had, I had a uh, shot today, um, well, going into 10 on the old course. Oh, really? Yeah. Drove fast, so, <laughs> uh, so going into 10 on the old course, where I was, I was standing in position, I, I'd hit my shot already, but I was standing in position from 70 yards away on the old course, where you could have had two different, you had two completely different shots that you could have played. You had an eight iron that you would pitch just maybe 10, 15 yards in front of you and let it roll and let it roll down to the green, up into the middle of the green. Or I could have pitched it all the way and landed it just short of the pin, like a 60 yard, 60 yard pitch. So you have two different options, clear options there. So next time you go down the 10th in the old course, stand in the middle up there, 70 yards, 60 yards away, and, and think about two, two different options. I'd have played the show. And what the landing spots would be. What the landing spots would be. Just final part on that, which relates to Ros's question. Those, those of you who have done an on-course session with me, which is a few of you in here, one of the things you'll recognise is that I, I say to people to pitch from any distance. You can be 220 yards away from the green and still get you to pitch it. But you can pitch with a fiber down the fairway. Because at the end of the day, if there's nothing in front of you, why not do a little half swing? knock a five, 130 yards in front of you and through the air and get it to run another 60 yards. It's 
Golf is made up of so many different ways of doing it. Don't think of a, don't compartmentalise a pitch shot to being this and a chip shot to being that. That's why we said you can chip with a three iron, you can pitch with a three iron. You can chip with a sand iron, you can pitch with a sand iron. Don't ever think clubs are stuck to certain shots. All a club is, is trajectory. Which, in short, it means run. The trajectory when it lands is the run when it, when it goes out. So just think of it in those terms. Right, I think that's very good. Well done, Tom. Um, okay, so now we get on to, uh, to an extension of that, which is now bunkers. Which is Chris. Yeah, so I've obviously got the, the easy part. <laughs> 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 bunkers. Um, no, it's you see a semi for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, whenever I have a bunker lesson, it's before we've even got to the, the practice ground, it's ten negative things about why I hate bunkers. There's a real, for me, a misconception about bunkers. It's it's actually a really good place to be. Sometimes it's it 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 for us. We can't control the ball. We're Lee, in so much it. control in a bunker. So hopefully, uh, we can. I think you're going to have to work hard. Yeah, that's it. Right. 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 Bunkers are a really good thing. Right. 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 Um, so going into a bunker, what, what, you know, what needs to happen to get out of the bunker? We need love. Um, we need the, the club to sort of the. The, the, yeah, the club to slide underneath the ball. Okay, so we've, we've lost. Um, <laughs> Ooh, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah. Um, so we've lost. Quite obvious, you might, you might choose your sand wedge or your um, log wedge, 60 degree wedge. But what we're actually going to do, we're going to open the face even more so we, we can guarantee that that ball is going to go upward. It's not going to move forward, it's going to shoot upwards, so we're going to open the face. Now, in lessons, obviously people grip the club and then open the face, okay? We, we can't do it. We need to open the face and then we will grip the club, okay? So just gripping the club, open the face, it's going to throw everything out. You, there's no way on earth you're going to return turn the club in that, in that position, okay? So it's really, really important. We open that club to, to that the face is pointed up to the sky, so any contact at all is just going to shoot the ball up, okay, and then, then we grip it up, okay? So that is the first thing. So stance, we're going to, when we get into the bunker, we're going to make sure they're slightly wider than, than uh, shoulder width apart, okay? This is just for stability, um, and we're going to wriggle our feet into the, into, the, into the sand. What this is going to do, we're actually going to be below the ball, okay? So when we swing, our low point of the golf, Golf swing is actually going to be below the ball as well, so we're not going to have any contact with the ball. The, the club is just going to slide into the sand, go on under the ball and pop it up with our, with our loft. Okay? Um, Taking off the body alignment. So with, with our cl club face being open, all of a sudden it's also pointing right. So a bit, a bit there, you can just point it straight at the target and we're fine. So we're a bit open, pointing out to the right. So with our, with our body alignment, actually we're going to do the opposite. So everything is going to point to the left. So while we do this, we're going to our feet. If I was aiming at this, if I wanted the ball to be um, yeah. go towards the door, yeah, Tom, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I would do, I would, I would set up. I would actually have my open club face pointing straight at Tom, and then I would work around that. So my feet are going to be aiming quite a long way left. My shoulders are going to follow, my knees are going to follow, my hips are going to follow, and we would actually swing along the line of our, of our feet. Now because that club face is open, and the club face has so much say on, on the actual start direction of the ball, what is going to happen is it's not going to go the direction of our feet, actually it's going to pop up and go somewhere towards where the club face is pointing. Okay? So you might, you might find when, when you do this, that the, that the ball will actually go somewhere in the middle. So I just have a bit of a trial and error session where you actually start the club face right of your target. Feet are going to be pointing just, just left of the target and you might find that that, that sort of narrows down where you, where you want the ball to be. Okay. Ball position. So another great great one in lessons to know people who have their ball position. Oh, well, talk me through what you're going to do. Oh, I'm just going to hit two, two inches in front of the ball. Um, it's every single bunker lesson that is, that, is, that really is. So we, we want the bunker, the ball position to be forward, but we don't want 
to hit before the ball. We want to hit naturally so we, we find our low point but actually just pop the ball in front of that low point. Okay, so we're not hitting down, oh, I'm just going to try to catch two inches in front of the ball. No, we're going to put the ball forward. Now everybody's going to be different. Um, not everybody can have a, you can't set a ball position for the, for the bunker shot. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd really recommend getting in the bunker, going through the routine that we've just discussed, and pretending that there's a ball there, and actually hitting some shots about a ball, you'll see your almost divot mark, and wherever the middle of that divot mark is, that's where you want your ball, okay? I think um, a really good way of, of doing that is if you imagine that, if you imagine if you extend the bunker, you can do this for chipping as well, you? You, put a, you draw a line with your shoe, so you basically leave a mark in the bunker, and you try and hit that line, what you'll find is the base of your arc will either be on the line, forward of the line, or behind the line. You're going to be one of them, whatever that is. Reference that line then relative to where it is in your feet. So now you know if you hit that line all the time, that, ball's, that line is two inches inside your left heel, the ball needs to be about two inches forward of that. So now the ball's going to basically be on the left heel. So you've done a little calibration. Just, just doing what Chris has done as well, put the guards to a calibration for how open you stand, which is quite a thing to get used to. It takes a while to get used to that. The best way of calibrating in a bunker is to stand perfectly square to your target. Open your club face. Now, everybody opens their club face a different amount. Every, there are some people who are massively open, some people are only a little bit open. So as Chris is saying, we can't tell you how much, you've got to find how much you like to open the club face, what sits in your eye line. Then hit a shot, hitting towards the flag. But because that club face is open, that ball's going to come out two yards right the flag, three yards right the flag, whatever that is. If you are consistently hitting it three yards right the flag for a ten yard bunker shot, you now know if you're a ten yard bunker shot, I'll just turn three yards left of the target with my open club face and that ball's going to come out straight. So calibrate. Don't guess at it, do a little calibration. But remember as well, what's really important is when you do that calibration with the ball, the, um, the line in the ground, if you're hitting behind all the time, as Chris rightly said, so you're hitting back there, the ball only needs to be here. There's no thing that needs to be on the front tail or whatever. Now, if you had coaching and, and you worked at it, we would try and get that ball further forward than that because you'd want to be posting and rotating, which is what we've already done, but so that's way that's the way of calibrating where the bottom of the swing is and the amount you weigh left for a right hand. Okay. Um, go back to what Lee um, and Tom said as well. So once we're in our in our position, our, our posture, we've got our stance, try and post on that left leg as well. Again, so we're, we're almost putting pressure on that left leg and we're going to turn everything around that. Again, we're going to go straight down the line of the feet, shoulders, the knees, and the hips, um, and we can we can almost judge how far we want the shot to be by length of swing. So this might go from maybe a, a, a really short short one if we're only um, five ten yards away to maybe a pitch, a uh, full pitch using the, the extra hinge of the hips, um, and then rotate fr fully through. Um, another one that you see is the. Oh, I'll hit this. I've no, just hit it. I'll, I'll hit this. I've made contact. I have to stop now. You know, not, not in no golf swing have you ever seen anybody stop at the ball no, on a score on a normal shot. But it, yeah, in a bunker, we think it's acceptable. So really concentrate the next time in your bunker, almost ignoring the ball, and, and think prior to it, I'm just going to finish in a, I call it a pose position. Okay, so it's really important to finish in that position that. Um, you uh, you want to be rather than stab at the ball. Oh, this gone half <laughs> guard. Mark, why is that so mean? This is obviously resonating. <laughs> you recognise that yesterday, like the weekend. <laughs> it's when you pull your club out, you've just got to just grab this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So your your shot out of the bunker, yards to go is really out of that's similar plus, uh, plus normal players, like a 60 yard head shot in terms of a swing forward. Well, well again, again, I think that's a bit 
trial and error really to see how far you're actually hitting hitting the shot. Now, for some people, a half swing might might go 25 yards out of the bunker. Some it would probably go five or ten. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bit of a. Um, I think that's what I do. I, it is trying to. I, I have to say, I tend to use the idea that if you think the resistance to the sand, the sand is going to resist the club hit spin. And obviously, you're not making contact with it, obviously, you don't have compression on the ball, so it comes out dead or anything. I always use the, the thought that um, whatever it is, is three times. So if it's 10 yards sharp, swing it 30 yards. So that the sand is going to resist. It's, it's a crude, crude theory, but I think it's a really good one for you to stand on it. Well, if I a 30 yarder, then calibrate from that point. But generally, unless there's very little sand in the bunker, which means you're obviously not going to get much resistance, which you'll do on a wet day, the club just thins it out, doesn't it? Because there's no sand there to give way. If there is sand there, I think that's a good yardstick to go by, is to think of it as times it by three. And that's how big a swing you need to make. Chris, I was, Chris can I just say, yeah. I was going to ask you about that, that normally we try and splash, splash the sand out yeah. and the ball will carry out on yeah. the on this. So if there's absolutely firm sand and you can't splash, what, what's the technique? Um, sand. <laughs> <laughs> So wet, wet. Well, so. wet, firm, oh, hard, <laughs> or black or so now. We'll just say it's blown out for this one. <laughs> this this so is heavy sands, if I'm right. It's a heavy sand rather than like light stuff. Very true. Different sands. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to have, you're gonna have ultimately a different contact. Um, I, would, I would always try and maintain speed. So regardless of what, how wet it is or how, how much is in there, I would almost always, always say um, maintain your speed and don't, don't almost try and force it out of the, oh it's, it's a bit wet in here, I better lean back and try and flick it out. I would keep to the same principles um, and yeah, just maintain. But you still try and go You can definitely look at altering one major factor though, which is, is bounce on a sand wedge is designed in sand to help you slide through the sand. If you have a very hard compact lie, as in it's a wet day, or there's very little sand, 16th on the on the old for a while and then no sand. So if you think in those terms, then bounce is all of a sudden not really your friend. So where a sand iron is superb normally, now a log wedge might be more advisable if you've gone because there's less bounce in the log wedge. So now you're playing it a little bit more like a chip shot. So a little bit squarer in the club face, so that you can now get under the ball. Because obviously opening the club face makes the club bounce, hence one of the reasons why we do it. So by using a lob wedge, which you now square up, you've still got loft because you've added loft by using a lob wedge. But now you can get under the wall. So the sharper the leading edge, which a lob wedge has got, gets under more compact sand. So on fluffy sand, never use a lob wedge. Because a lob wedge is just going to go straight into the sand. On, on compact, hard, or very little sand, Start using a log wedge because you need it to try and dig underneath them. So you, would, you wouldn't open the face then, you'd hit it with the natural square. Well, the problem with opening the face is when you're in a, in a hard bunker, hard sand lies, as soon as you open the face, the whole point of opening is it is down to bounce yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Now you're making life hard for yourself, so try and square the blade up a little okay. bit more. One thing to remember though is if you square the blade up, you need to square your stance up. Because one the whole point of aiming left is you aim the club face right, so one leads to the other. So if you bring that one in, you've got to bring that one in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So lies do make a difference on that. Um, and to go on slightly from that as well, if you've got a 40 yard bunker shot and you've got not much of a lick in front of you, play a normal bunker shot, but play it with an 8 or a 9 iron. You want the ball to fat out, which is what you're doing in a bunker shot, you're fatting the ball out by hitting the ground, and then you want it to run. Well, by using an 8 or a 9 iron, we'll get it to run. Falder was famous for using that shot, he used a 9 iron all over Augusta to get the ball to run out to its track, to its target. So, so don't always think of bunker shots as a sand iron, but a standard greenside bunker shot, generally, unless the lies are terrible, is going to be a sand iron. If the lie is really poor, you might err towards a lottery. Talking about log waves, when you buy a set of clubs, you've got a sand range and a pitching range. And that's it. You don't know what they yeah. are, a sand range and a pitching range. When you go to look at a log wedge, suddenly you get these 
bounces and nothing. Yep. 12 degrees. That's when you seek professional. <laughs> 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 That's why we do free fittings because yeah. it really is, it's a minefield. Right? You've got to get the right bounds for your type of action. If you get the wrong bounds, underrated part of wedge is this, really underrated part of wedge. If you get the incorrect bounce on a wedge, especially if you get too little bounce on a wedge, you will spend your life trying not to take a dipper. You'll be doing this all the time. Because if you have too little bounce, the shut front edge is just going to go straight into the surf, into the turf. So you're, if you're going to do one way or the other, I'm sure you boys, more bounce is better than less bounce. But bounce is really, really important to get correct. Because if you imagine, it comes back to what was already said, if you start there with a shaft at that angle, and you come in with a shaft at that angle, you've now presented that front edge. You need some serious bounce on that club for that club not to go straight into the sand or to the, into the ground. You need some bounce to help that club slide. So that's why it is important to get the right bounce. When we do um, fitting for wedges, we put a bit of tape on the bottom and we can see where the, the contact is, whether it's at the front, back or middle. Um, so that's a, a thing to consider if you haven't had your wedges fitted already. Yeah. To come and look where your contact is. What's grind? Grind is, well bounce and grind are different but they're related. Grind is the manner in which they shape the sole. Right. Bounce is purely the height at which the bottom of the club is above the face yeah. of the front end. Now the grind means that grind means that if you have certain grinds like the M grind, where they the heel edge is shaven off and the toe edge is shaven off, you can now open, close, ah, do all okay. sorts without changing the bounce. Yeah. If you had a standard sole which hasn't got much of a grind, and then you open it, you've increased the bounce, you've decreased the bounce effectively. So grind is very different than bounce, although they are intrinsically linked. But there's quite a few options in grind, right? Tons. Yeah. Tons. I mean I know what bounce I like, but the grind option was just trial no. and error and found what I like. Yeah, absolutely. It is, yeah. But, uh, but they're now reducing they're now reducing grinds down to coincide more with that grind is that bounce, that grind is that bounce. Craig, what would you do if your ball is like in a doggy footprint? Oh. Like in a, in a bit of a hole. Well, first, first you'd swear, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's a depends, on whether it, depends on whether it's close to being a plug lie yeah. and then you treat it like a plug lie if it's close to being a plug lie. Um, so, I'd like. I'd want, I, want, I want to increase the angle of attack, so I'd, I'd want to go down into the sand much quicker rather than almost, when we go with what Lee was saying, almost um, being quite shallow and using the ground, I'd really want to get into the sand as much as, as quick as possible and almost, I don't want to say the word stab, but almost... Uh, you're right, it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Into the ground. It's one of the only occasions you stab at yeah. the yeah. golf ball. Yeah. 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 Loads of speed. And just try and hope it splashes out really. I mean, you know, technique for that is, is, is quite hard to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're very unlucky. Very unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not feeling bitter about it. No. 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 Somebody had raped one and you had a dog print. You had a bad day, haven't you? Really, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's um, where I go with, with um, underplay. And, um, I hope. So in the situation where you don't have um, an open access to the green and you're at that 60 yard bunker shot, I mean I'd much rather be 140 yards away in a yeah. bunker than 60. How, Hardest shot and golf. Yeah, how do you go about, what strike do you try and achieve? Do you, do you say, well I'm just going to have a very short swing and try and take no sand? Really good question. It, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's totally dependent on your line. If the ball is cuppy, sitting down just a little bit, and you've now just got to accept you're going to have to blast it out and hope it does what it does. If it's sitting on the top, now you can start putting it back in the stance a little bit and nip it out um, just to get it to flight there. But it is, well, unless you want, but I, I'd say it's, it's really down to line. It's almost, that's almost when you want a firm bunker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's resistance on, on the sands and just play that square hit shot with the sand wedge or, or gap wedge or and yeah, that, that would be quite different. So it's almost play that shot with less resistance to sound. So to do that, you change your low point and maybe not wiggle your feet in the sand, stand on top of the sand, try and change that low point. So take, take that. 
I think that's something which we, Chris mentioned, but Tom's highlighted a really valid point. The whole point of wriggling your feet in the sand is not to just get stability. Of course, that gives you stability in the sand. But it actually gets you lower. Now, the whole point of a bunker shot is to hit under the ball. So if you lower yourself, you don't have to now hit under, you're automatically going to hit under. So by lowering, you are lower, if you see my logic there. You don't have to now hit down, you know, to, to get under it. So wriggling your feet into sand, it's not just something you just go, yeah, yeah, that feels good. It's, you think to yourself, I need to get under the ball here. So you wriggle your feet down into, so you really sat down into that sand. Now with a normal golf swing, you're going to effectively fat it. Which, because obviously you're lower than you would have been, so you're going to fat the ground. But that's what a bunker shot is, you're fatting the ball out of the bunker. It's just a structured fat. <laughs> yeah. Structured fat. A structured fat. John, I wasn't looking at you there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we do that? Yeah. 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 Good. Obviously, great butter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, well done, Chris. Pretty. Um, okay, putting. Uh, I got left with putting because we're like, oh, we'll just do putting at the end then. <laughs> but But uh, okay, putting. What you've probably noticed is there is a thing. The technique, whether it be chipping, pitching, or bunkers, is the same. The setup alters slightly to a bunker than it does to chipping and pitching, i.e. balls in changes, you aim left, etc. But the swing and technique is the same. Now the thing they've all mentioned is the fact that when you're making the action in all the other shots, in effect, your rib cage moves your arms. That's really what's happening. You, you never ever want the arms to independently move to the rib cage. If anyone struggles with chipping, I'll put my bottom dollar on the fact their arms are independent to the rib cage. Which now means you've got to time how, re whether their arms are separated, you've got to bring them back, or whether they've, as Lee said, get too close to the body, you've now got to throw them away. So if the rib cage and the arms stay constant, pretty much going to come back to the same spot based on you staying still as you do it. Does that all make sense? So that's the principle with which we've done all of the chipping, pitching, and bunkers. Now the major difference between putting and those shots is one simple thing. On all the other shots, because they have a loft on them, I know a putter's got four degrees of loft on it, but zero in fact. Um, on all the other shots, in, other, in order to get the loft of the club to do what you need the ball to do, you need a descending blow. So on all the other shots in the game of golf, in short game, you post up. That's what posting up is for. To allow you, as Lee showed brilliantly with the hips and shoulders going that way, that now means you're going to have a descending blow. Don't need a descending blow and putting. So in effect, you don't need to post up. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but you don't need to do that in putting. But the principles of putting are very related to the chipping and pitching. One major difference being a putter sits considerably more upright than a wedge. You can see there's a massive difference between them. So now, if the putt is much more upright, we are closer to it, we're more on top of it, which now means my rotation is a little bit more in a straight line, not in a straight line, but closer to a straight, than a full open closed door effect. Does that make sense? Yeah, because then you're more upright. So take all the principles that have been, done, been mentioned there. One of the fabulous ones was Lee mentioning about high wrist. Anyone who's had a lesson with me, I'm always saying, get your left wrist high, get your left wrist high, get your left wrist high. So to take on what Lee said, I, I always use a little drill, which is simple as this. Put your hand out, imagine you're pulling the trigger of a gun. Pardon the analogy, but it's a great way of doing it with your left hand. Yeah, now so you've got thumb up, finger out. Now drop your hand down, your wrist down until the thumb is now horizontal. That is a great way of feeling what the left wrist should be when you're setting up to a part of the gym. So you've effectively flattened the top of that wrist. As Lee rightfully said, the second you have any angle between the forearm 
and the wrist, you're going to be unstable. You're going to have all sorts of flicking going on with hands. So if you think in terms of, get that lined up there. Now when I come down now, you'll see when I'm in that position there with that high left wrist, is that that shaft is effectively an extension on the same angle as my forearm. I can only think of one top player in the modern game who pups well with that, and that's Ian Poulter. Ian Poulter has angle. Ironically, one of the best putters under pressure there is, but let's not get it. But if you look at all the other top putters in the history of the game, they all have that straight line running up there. Great way of you thinking about stabilising the wrist, because the one thing we don't want in putting, as you're all aware, is rotation. We don't want rotation. All comes back to the same thing. Every single shot you play requires a power source but try to go to the minimum power sources on short game. Maximum power sources really on long game. Obviously you want to generate power on long game, but we want to minimise power on short game. So only use power sources that are required. So with an action in putting that really is no more than that to that pendulum type looking stroke, it's not quite pendulum, we'll come to that. Then you don't need additional power sources. So you don't need legs, you don't need hands, you don't need weight shift, you don't need all those transfers. So if you think in terms of, just before we get onto any drills in it, putting is pretty much a neutral stance. I'm a fan of 60% left foot, 40 right foot, but it's near as damn it, neutral. And then you are going to keep your lower half still, and it's only the top half and that rotation of the couple that hits the putt. If you were to add the hips in all the way through, Two things are now going to happen. One, because there's no loft on that putter, where you turn, that's where the ball goes. The opposite of chipping. When Lee's working across the ball, the ball will still go forwards because it's got loft. When there's no loft on a putter, the ball will go where he turns to. So if you use your hips, which you would on chipping and pitch, pitching, it's going to go left generally, and you've added a power source, so that ball all of a sudden from 15 foot away goes 22 foot because you've just gone off line up. Killed it there. Does that make sense? So realistically in putting, knees stay exactly as they are throughout. Years ago, Palmer, for instance, was not knee that way. We tend to now say it's actually slightly better if you want to keep the knees quite up to go the other way and actually push them apart. Because by pushing them apart, you actually knock the hips out a little bit more. So it just keeps your knees and your hips quiet. And then it effectively it is the top half over the lower half as opposed to the chips having that fluid Blowing action on the way through, but that's to help you hit down on it. Once again, related to what Lee said, because Lee's is the closest one to, to putting, uh, related to what Lee said, if I just show you, no matter what I do with that club, that ball will go straight. That ball will go straight. I don't care where my path is, that ball will go straight. So I can hook it all I like. Look at that ball. I'll do it straight. So don't worry about your stroke. Your stroke is nowhere near as important as you think it is. Of course there is an element of it makes it easier if, you, if you've got a better stroke. But the reason that ball, goes, that ball goes straight is because the ball goes with a face point. Same as Lee's in the chipping. When Lee's talking about working the club across the ball, there's not enough energy on that ball. Even if he cuts across it like that, there's not enough energy on that ball for the spin he put on it to take effect, to make the ball bend. So the ball just goes straight. Obviously, if you did that with the driver, as we all know, everyone's ball goes out for 150 yards dead straight and you think you've nailed it, and then all of a sudden it goes right and indicator, and it just starts drifting off to the right. That's because that's the point at which the spin is now taking effect and starts going. So think in terms of Club face is key when it comes to short game. So as Lee said, pulling the handle to the left, working across to the left a little bit, isn't going to make the ball go left as long as the club face is still square. So same with putting. If you think in terms of don't worry too much about where your stroke goes, but you do need to worry about where your club face is. So think in terms of club face, I always like to think of it as your club face is your left wrist. Everybody, not quite everybody, but most people who have problems with putting use their right hand if they're a right hander. 
and your right hand becomes too dominant. So one of the things to do if you're ever struggling with putting is to putt with your right hand, just your right hand, and see if that's a bit that has a little bit of a, a wobble and a flick. Then putt with your left hand and go, oh, look how solid that was. We now know that's your problem. Take this out of the equation, you should have an issue. So if you think of the back of your left hand, this is the club face. You should also think in terms of, nothing set, we all do it slightly differently, but the closer the back of the left hand is to flat, as in pointing to the target, the easier it is to maintain that face relationship. <coughs> Excuse me, that face relationship. As soon as you turn your hand, like a full shot would be when it's there, one of the reasons for turning the hand in the full shot is to allow some freedom of movement through the shot. Well, we don't want that. We want that to be a locked position. So you're better off generally in putting to have your left hand for right hand this is, I apologise if there's any lefties today. But um, you're better off having zero knuckles on your left hand than you are two. Here I can see two, there I can see zero. So if you look at someone like Tiger, Tiger, you can't see anything, there's nothing. You, his hand's not that. You won't see any knuckles on his left hand at all. So that's a simple way of thinking about making sure you can keep the club face squarer. Now just to dispel a couple of myths, for years and years and years it was always taught rock the shoulders and keep the putter face square. You've all probably heard that. <coughs> Physics means that's not actually possible. Michelle Weed's probably the closest we've come to getting somebody to do that. The reason Michelle Weed, for those of you who saw it, actually bent over so she was almost horizontal with her spine, was so now if the shoulders turn, they turn up and down. The second we start standing more up, the shoulders have to work around the spine, so they work on a slight rotation. So the axis of your spine is the amount you rotate. So that's why, once again, stroke, don't worry about it. If you're severely inside, severely inside or just a slight inside, a lot of that will be down to whether you were standing there or there. Because here, it's going to be straighter than there. Does that make sense? Yeah? So don't worry too much about the look of your stroke. That really isn't important. Can you keep the club face square and can the ball start on line? To check whether you can keep the club face square, am I losing you or are you all with me so far? <coughs> with me? That's a lot I've lost you. <laughs> so we're on that myself, aren't you? <laughs> in order to check how the club should work, put the putter out in front of you in the high left wrist. Cuddle the tops of your arms from basically the elbow up to your chest. I cannot think of one putter in the history of the game bar. Unfortunately, Nicholas. <laughs> it, never be honest, Nicholas was a phenomenal pressure putter, but he wasn't actually the best putter in the game. He's just a phenomenal pressure putter. But Nicholas, because Nicholas used to do that. But all good putters in it have always kept their elbows connected to their chest. Or well, certainly the tops of their arms connected to their chest. If you watch any of the top putters, you will not see daylight in here at any point on any good putter. They are just rocking from the shoulders. So a great way of understanding the feeling is Connect your elbows to your chest, now make a stroke. So if I now just turn, without any hands at all, my club face is open. You see how it's turned to the right? Okay, my, my ball would go miles right now. But that club face isn't open, it's square to me. So if I came back, it's still square. <coughs> Where you would have a problem is if the, the putter face is not related to you. So if you aren't moving, but the putter is, now that putter face is open. But that also means this relationship has changed. You all with me? Yeah. yeah? So a great way of thinking, well, how much should my putter be arcing? It's going to arc. It has to arc. For that putter to stay square, I'm going to have to change in order to keep that putter face square to the target. It's just not, it's not really a viable stroke to make. So don't be scared of allowing the putter to have a little bit of opening and closing and arcing as long as it's relative to you. So, a few things you need to do in order to make good stroke. First thing is work on the premise that you never, physics once again unfortunately states that this is impossible, but theoretically, work on the premise you are never going to accelerate or decelerate a putt. 
you basically make a stroke, a cadence of stroke, a length of stroke that allows you to just make a rhythmical action back and through. If you are unbalanced in your stroke, i.e. you're a little bit short this way, you're going to have to generate some speed that way to get it to the hole. If you go long that way, you're going to have to decelerate to not hit it past the hole. Now you're having to control it. That now means you are varying the way you deliver that putter to the ball. So think in terms of, it is tick, top. This longer putt, tick, top. I know by being longer you are going to have a faster stroke, because it's a longer stroke. But the reality is you're keeping it constant throughout. Don't accelerate or decelerate into the ball. So practice, I, I've been doing it recently, practice with a metronome. It's my, my ex-wife was a concert pianist, so I used to spend hours in my full time with a metronome on the green, just putting to a metronome. It's only a couple of weeks ago, I remembered about it, and I bought a sudden downloaded a metronome on the phone, and now practicing to a metronome. Find the cadence that's right for you. Branch Nedica is really quick, but it's, it's, it's back and through the same. It's not slow, quick. It's, it's just a quick action. Nick Price's golf swing years ago was a quick as long as it's constant, it doesn't really matter. Everyone with me so far now? Yeah? So, a few things to work on. Strike, relating back to what we've already been talking about. Strike is the number one thing to get consistency. Club face is a thing to actually hold them. So you need to work on club face, squareness to hold putts. But there's no point hitting a great putt that comes up four foot short because you thinned it to the ball in roll. So, putting two rubber bands either side of the centre of the face and hitting some putts and trying to make sure you hit the middle of the face bang, as so you hit the middle of the face, you've got a strike that's going to hit a pretty reasonable putt as soon as you hit a putt where you are, you know, the putter moves around and you hit it out of the rubber, it just doesn't roll you'll soon learn everybody cares about how they strike a driver and a five line no one really ever thinks about how do I strike my putts I would say 95% of the people I teach putting to thin their putts. Virtually everybody thins their putts. Now years and years and years ago, there was this myth that if you hit up on a putt, oh, if you put the top spin on the ball, it rolls better. Well, it doesn't. It just makes the ball jump and bounce, and therefore it doesn't roll better. You actually need a ball to be going with no spin whatsoever, because a ball has, this has loft, the ball will skid if you watch on the putting green on a dewy morning, off the face there's no mark. And then all of a sudden it starts leaving a mark on the dew. Because the ball skids. And what makes the ball have overspin or top spin is the ball skids, gently touches the surface, grips the surface, and that's now what makes the ball overspin. So that's why you want to make sure that you get the strike consistently so that overspin is the same every single every single time. A brilliant way of checking your putting is to come out on a day where there's either mist, dew or raindrops on the green and hit some putts. And you'll see most people's balls go bounce, 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 bounce and then start rolling. A good player's ball will have no mark for about that far after the putter and then just roll. So they've got consistency. The other thing on that one, and I'm sure you've all seen it before, good putters always look like their putts will never reach the hole and they keep going. Bad putters look like their ball needs to sit down and stop, and never reaches the hole. And that's because a poor putter will hit the ball, so it jumps off the face, which now means it's not rolling. It's skidding, bouncing, it doesn't get rolling. So that is a great way of getting a sensation of a strike, first of all. Uh, the second thing is making sure that you bring your hands back to where you started. So there's a theme on everything. So if you start, I don't really mind where your hands are in a dress. I, I care about whether you'd be that way, as in high risk. I don't really care whether your hands forwards, hands neutral, hands back. Zach Johnson, phenomenal putter with his hands behind. But the reason he's phenomenal is because he returns to that same spot every single time. What? Without getting into a slightly different subject here, the only thing about that is if you are, for instance, a hands forward putter, you like to push your wrist forward at dress. Phil Mickelson, massive forward press. You cannot have a putter that doesn't have this big kink at front. People don't realise. This thing here, the hose on the putter, dictates which style of putter for which 
style of putting. That is for somebody who puts their hands forward. What's known as a half shaft putter, where the shaft goes straight into the head, is for people with their hands back or neutral. So make sure you've got the right one for your type of, type of stroke. Okay, with regards to the rotation, remember the rotation of the top face is purely relative to you. The more over it you are, the less rotation. The more vertical you are, the more rotation it's going to generally be in it. But now you've got to get the rhythm of the stroke. So the length of a putt is only ever controlled by the length of the stroke. Shorter putt is a shorter stroke. Longer putt is a longer stroke. Never hit it harder, never hit it softer. If ever you've got a downhill putt, especially coming into the season when you've got vicious downhill putt, don't hit it softer. That's a common mistake. You see somebody in a really scary putt, and what they end up doing is going <laughs> negatively like that. Well, that basically means you've made your normal backstroke, and then you've tried to control how soft you hit it on the way through. Try and think of the putt as a shorter putt. How much more is this ball going to roll because of the slope? Think of that as a shorter putt, and hit a normal conviction putt. Normal stroke. You don't want to hit it softer or harder. Make sense? Yeah? Okay, so... Major things to do in, in uh, putting are to get distance control pace. So use ladder drill. Anyone who knows the ladder drill? So you basically put a, a marker down four foot from the ball, five foot, six foot, seven foot, eight foot. Go to four foot, then go to five foot, then go to six foot, then go to seven foot. The better you get at it, the more you go, I'm going to go two foot on this one, three foot on this one, I'm going to go seven foot on this one, I'm going to... So you're varying it up. That now means you're in control of the pace of the putt. For direction control, use shafts, use sticks like Lee did for his chicken, create a channel. You can either do that or you can use tea cakes, but create a channel and basically you're going to stand and hit the putt down the channel. That now means you've got some direction control. That doesn't have to be rocket science. If you can get that to start down that line, whether it be a 3 footer or a 10 footer or a 25 footer, that ball is not going to deviate much offline. But if you can't hit it between those sticks for even a four foot putt, so you can imagine what that's like over 25 foot. So get the ball started on nine. That is prime. And I know it sounds silly what I said at the beginning, but you can really play around with that and think to yourself, crikey, a stroke isn't as important as everybody thinks it is. It really isn't. Everyone gets obsessed. One of the questions I always get asked is, I can't take a putter away without it wobbling. It doesn't really matter. As long as that putter face is square through impact, it doesn't really matter. Anyone got any uh, any thoughts on club face control? Anyone do anything in particular? Uh, not necessarily that, but what you were talking about, uh, delivering the club face back to the uh, ball. Um, when you're uh, <coughs> hitting that putter, and I've got like those itsy bitsy ones, you know, yeah. that prints away so you like, and then you've got the play ones there. Yeah. I find it helps me just to deliver the club face flat back against the ball. Stops it from going into it, if you know what I mean. And there's a bigger sweet spot. It always there. You know, can you shoot with your very good blades or when there's a way to cut it? Well, good question. Uh, is there a big sweet spot? It depends on the perimeter weighting. It obviously means the further away from the centre the weighting is, the bigger the sweet spot, generally. Um, also, the further away the weights are from the centre, the more likely that is to have less twisting through impact. I think that's a really important thing to remember. The difference between a blade style putter and a mallet style putter, most of the time isn't actually, I think it's a bit of a myth, isn't actually about whether or not you can deliver the putter squarely. Where mallets are quite good is if you hit slightly at the toe or slightly at the heel, that, there's going to be twist. It's inevitable, there's going to be some twist on the face. Well, the more stable the weights are either side, the less twist there is. So it just minimises off-centre hits a little bit. That's really why mallets are better, because you can get mallets for really strong arcs, and you get mallets for straight arcs, pardon me. <laughs> but yeah, the straight line is straight. So about people thinning their putts in there, yeah. how do you stop that? OK, really good one, which is, uh, the reason I like 60% is I like to get the get thing in when I'm setting up to it. Or any of my, I like getting the feeling that the shoulders are as level as they can get them. One of the reasons why so many good putters have gone this way round, like Sir Jordan Speed, for instance, is it automatically lowers his left shoulder. That now means that he's going to get a, you can hear that noise, quite a, a nice strike as opposed to coming up on it thin. 
every other shot in the game of golf where the shoulders are working up in some point through the action, unfortunately in putting, you work the shoulders up, and you're going to generally tend to thin it a little bit. So get that sensation of, of setting up a little bit, as Lee would say, hosting down a little bit, drop the left shoulder just a little bit. And it's really important, it's the only shot in golf where the putter or the club passes you. In all the other shots, full swing to short, the chest outruns the club. In all other shots. But because we're not rotating on this shot, it is the only shot where the putter passes you by. So if you add to that passing you by, you're going to thin it. What you've got to do is think in terms of the sternum. Comes back to this, they're all related. If the sternum stays in the same spot, the, the uh, arc is consistent. As soon as you see that, which is what we see on pretty much everyone else's putting lesson, that way, heads move back, arcs going that way, is often a thin. That's when the ball really hops and skips and bounces. So just try and feel like you stay <coughs> centred over it the whole time. It's always staying centred over it. So a lot of people who try and create top spin on the golf ball, which we see in the putting a lot, they're the ones that actually thin it quite a lot. Yeah. Because the leading edge is, is rising and gets to the ball rather than passing. Which leads nicely into where the ball position for putting. Ball position is the bottom of the arc. You want the ball in a putt to be an absolute base point of the arc. You don't want a downward blow, you don't want an upward blow. You want it to be at the zero point in the arc. So just do some strokes and think to yourself, where do you brush the grass? You know, if you're going to brush the grass, Jenny, where do you brush? If that's a little bit back of centre, do you know what? Put it back of centre. Put it back, put it where the base of the arc is, because that's the important. There's no point being perfect in more than those little three inches inside the left hand if all you do is thin it all the time. Put the ball back to wherever the bottom of the swing is. Now what you might then want to do is try and change where the bottom of the swing is in order to get a better strike, to be more neutral as it were, but that's what you've got to do, that's what you've got to do. I sometimes think with putting, and unfortunately I haven't got one here to do it, I sometimes think with putting, everybody gets obsessed with doing it so correctly, because putting is so finite, it is so, you either hold it or you miss it. Well, a drive, you heat it a bit, curves a bit, still on the fairway, it's a nice drive. Putting, you've missed it or you've folded it. So everyone tries to do putting perfectly. I'm a huge fan of getting people who get too caught up in it to putt with a three wood. I think it's a fabulous way of, of getting back some ideas. So if you putt with a three wood, massive long shaft, so you, you basically hold right down the shaft and just do a few putts of the three wood. Because I'll tell you one thing, if you put any hands in a three wood, that ball's gone off the green. Because it's got spring face technology, the ball's going to go off. So it just gives you a really good idea of just pushing, pushing through the ball rather than hitting at it. It also means that you can't do that, because if you did, you're going to chip it. So it's a great way of just getting it. It's not about holding putts to that, it's just about understanding, OK, there's some rhythm, there's some feel to a putting stroke with a three. Darcy did it for years, he practiced with a three. Just getting some rhythm back, because I do think putting is one of the major areas, and, and chipping, maybe not some pitching, but where people get over caught up on doing it correctly. And as I've already proven, you can do what you like, really, as long as the face is square. So that's, that's really where you want to look at it. So when you finish a putting stroke, your checkpoint, bottom line is, did I strike it, number one, and is that face relative to me? So in other words, if you set up with the butt of the putter pointing at my sternum, we'll use that as an example for here, that's pointing at my sternum, is it still pointing at my sternum there? If it's not pointing at my sternum there, you're not in control. Doesn't matter where that is. Steve Stricker's my famous for the fact that he's one of the best putters in my opinion, said Walker. Steve Stricker's putter points to his left chest and address. But there's a famous video of him where at every single point, of every single moment of his entire stroke, they draw that line back to a one minute dot on his chest. So it's always relative to his starting point. So wherever your hands are, so be it, as long as you maintain them. So you can see realistically, the only difference with putting over chipping is you don't rotate the lower half, because that's a little bit of a downward blow and an element of power. So realistically, chip putting has no power source for the shoulders. Chipping has no power source on the way back, but flow with the hips on the way through. Pitching needs a power source on the way back, and therefore needs a power source on the way through. And bunkers is the biggest version of it, because bunkers in general is a three times 
the length of shock because of resistance and sound. Does that all make sense? Yeah? Good. Anyone got any more questions on any of those bits? To Jim, not just me, but to, to the boys? I was going to ask you about um, so keeping your right hand um, overtaking the. Yep, yep. Um, I guess it's three week idea would be one. That's a really good one because you're really fit. The longer yeah. the club, the more you can be a flick. Absolutely. So that's, that's a really good way of doing it. The other one is to, to start doing some cuts with just the left hand. I promise you, to a man or woman, when you use just your left hand, your stroke will become a lot slower and softer. Because the right hand should pass it if you're right handed, it should pass it. So generally, those who are looking, it's a little bit tempo comes into it because the right hand's in front. So as soon as you put just the left hand on, for the same length up, you'll make a much longer, softer stroke. When you go, hmm, I'm really in control of that face, then you just turn around and think to yourself, okay, well, let's take that stroke, let's add the right hand, but effectively just putting it onto the club without gripping. So the right hand now is being told where to go. It's not involved, it's just being told where to go, and then gradually start introducing the right hand as part of it. But it's interesting, whenever somebody has yips, first thing they ever do to them is go, which hand is the problem hand to go? What do you mean? There is always one. So you get somebody else say, well, hit me a little six foot cut with your right hand. Ooh. And they do that, and you go, well, we've just discovered which is the dodgy <laughs> hand. Yeah? So therefore, you've got to learn to use the other hand which generally for right hander will be the left hander, it's the one that's the stable one. So yes, so if, if three wood drill is very good for that, but really find a way of, of doing it. I, I've got to be honest as well, I'm quite a big fan of this new modern day theory of putting it up before arm. So it rests up before arm, because effectively now you've created a locked position that you can't change through impact. So that I, I'm a fan of that idea, and that's where a three wood comes in again, because it's so long, you know, actually run it forearm. <clears throat> Second reason why running up your forearm is good is that shows you where your angle of the shaft is. If you are a handsy putter, that will now be underneath. Mm -hmm. When you start getting a locked left wrist, that runs up my forearm, you can't now see that stick. So now that stick is relative to where I am, and now I just use my chest to control that. One final thing on it, just to, just to um, finish off on it. I appreciate that everything we say, there will always be something that's different. There will always be somebody who doesn't do that. What we're trying to do as a team is give you the simplest way, for the amount you guys have practiced and played, a simple way of doing things. So when you take somebody like I don't know, Bobby Locke, Arnold Palmer, who are quite risky putters for instance, yeah, what you've got to remember is the reason they did quite well of that is because that was the only thing they did. When, when somebody like uh, somebody like Risky Putter, Izzy Ioki putted, no other part of his body moved. The only thing that moved was his hands. But his hands stayed where they were. So the only power source is the hinge. You wouldn't see anyone doing that well with the hands also moving away. Because now you're not going to return it. So although there's always people who do it differently, we're just trying to give you the simplest way of doing it. Minimise power sources, try to take the hands and arms out of it, which is the biggest power source generally, and use the body ball. But when it's a shorter shot, you use the body less. All make sense? Yeah. Good. I think that's pretty much sums it up. So I know you're all going to find it very difficult to believe, but uh, I probably hit my first golf ball best by 50 years ago. And uh, for the last 50% of that time, I've had the privilege of being a member of this golf club. Not with due respect to all the previous professional staff I've ever been associated with, I can honestly say that this current team is as good as it is as good as it gets. Yeah, yeah, so thanks yeah, very much, yeah, guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. Safe journey home. Yeah.